Good evening. This is Dr. John Bennett televising from Miami. Uh, we have another in a series of conferences for the Congress of the uh, of the uh, collaboration between Neurosurgical TV and the Ames Hospital A A W I M S, uh, headed uh, with uh, with uh, spearheaded by uh, Deepak Gupta, the part of neurosurgery of the Ames Hospital in New Delhi, uh, and we had a. a we have a we have a, the pleasure of having Ike Cherry again for a second talk at this conference. He's going to talk about the anatomy and physi physiology of cisternostomy. And we have a guest that just popped in. Let's introduce him. Well, good evening, Abdullah. Good evening, Dr. Bennett. Hello. Okay, can you Hello, tell us Dr. about yourself, please? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I'm Abdullah Reda I said I'm an Egyptian student who's studying in Bucharest, Romania. I just finished my third year of medicine and I'm going to the fourth year. Um, and I'm quite interested in neurosurgery as well. Um, it's a pleasure to, uh, to attend this hangout and uh, I'm very keen to listen to uh, what Dr. Ike is going to talk about today. Very good. And Ike has a great video channel. you got to check it out. Okay, yeah, sure. Ike, it's all yours. You're on mute. I, you're on mute. Okay. You're muted. I, I, you're muted. There you go. There you go. Good morning, everybody. Okay. Uh, I'd straight away start the talk. Uh, morning, Abdullah. So uh, I would screen share, John. Okay. Are you yes. seeing? Yes, we can see it well. Right. Well, I'm going to talk on the anatomy and physiology of uh, the surgery that I've been doing for a decade right now, uh, which would be cystinostomy. I'm going to tell you a few things about uh, what cystinostomy means, why, it's, why should it be done, advantages, disadvantages, uh, the technical details, and so on. So, uh, the striking thing in trauma is that the last major surgical advancement in trauma was decompression of the brain tumor, which was devised more than 100 years back. The rest of the branches have moved on, but uh, unfortunately, trauma has not. So trauma is, uh, you know, it's, it's still stuck. There are a lot of factors to it, but uh, right now, this forum is not uh, the right forum to discuss that. I'm going to start off with the scan that we showed yesterday. It's a scan of a small child. Uh, that is a pre-op scan. Looks pretty bad. Not very bad. That's after the surgery. This is not something you can see. Uh, the tube in there. Most important thing is see the damage there all, all around. But you see that the bone flap is intact and see that after six weeks see the child at discharge the same child follow up now I'm going to tell you four observations all four observations are uh, neutral observations Trauma and acute SH look similar. Anybody who's noticed, who's seen both trauma and acute SH, they look similar. Opening cisterns for SH gets the brain to be lax. Opening cisterns in other pathologies also gets the brain to be lax. And cutting the tent, cutting the tent to reach the cisterns in trauma was practiced and still in practice. Now, if I go on to the next uh, part, you must notice that many years back, tentorio to me, uh, was in vogue in cranial cerebral trauma. It was in vogue. Why was tentoriotomy ever done? I mean, all over the world, we know that tentoriotomy was done because they had to reach the systems. Uncasectomy, why was it done? It was done to reach the systems. So, it is not that it is a very new thing. It is. Uh, it is not a new thing. It's a it's an old thing, in fact. But 
going subfrontally and opening systems in a tight brain is new. Now, when do we do it? There's enough evidence to say that prophylactic surgery rather than waiting for the patient to be cooked is much better. So I would say cystinosomy, for cystinosomy also, this applies. We're just comparing the mortality, morbidity for our series of DHCs, DHCs plus cystinostomies and cystinostomies. And these are the mortality, the ventilator days, ICU stay and mean GRs. In Nepal, I cannot, I cannot afford to uh, do a much more sophisticated study and I have to tell you that these are the only four factors which is very easy to to make out and you must see what's the difference you know when we were doing DHC I understand that the mortality was high at 34.8 but we are in a place unlike United States or Europe where we have all the facilities but you, you take cystinostomy and see our mortality and it's still improving. And uh, this is the graph. This is for moderate head injuries. So now our indications after four years is severe head injury in adults with significant brain swelling and with cisterns not visualized. Acute subdural hematomas with mass effect, even if they don't classify as severe head injuries with respect to GCS. Multiple unilateral contusions in combinations with SDH or mass effect. Pediatric brain injuries with severe brain swelling. Traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage with swelling. Now, uh, I mean, few of the studies. Advantages and disadvantages. Now comes to anatomy. Now we're coming to why does this work? So what is the anatomy and what is the physiology of this surgery? Cystinostomy. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask uh, everybody when I had no evidence about six, seven years back, when uh, I was telling people that the CSF get, goes into the brain, and then people used to say, no, 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 it doesn't happen. So I always used to ask, in severe head injury, two hours later, you look at the scan, and then you don't see any CSF. And where is the CSF going to? Number one. Number two, why is the immediate brain swelling? I mean, you're talking about cytotoxic edema, it takes six hours for it to happen. So, why is the immediate brain swelling? And number two, where is all the CSF, the 120 ml of CSF in the basal systems getting displaced? So, you put one and one, to, one and one together, you would be inclined to think that the CSF in the base of the brain has actually gone into the brain, causing this edema. Now, experiments conducted at the University of Maryland in the 1980s by Grady and colleagues postulated that the existence of solute exchange between interstitial fluid of the brain parenchyma and the CSF via paravascular spaces. In 1985, Grady and colleagues suggested that cerebrospinal fluids and interstitial fluid exchange along specific anatomical pathways within the brain, with CSF moving into the brain along the outside of the blood vessels. This was the starting of our theory. So, for cystinostomy to work, CSF is going into the brain, or else there's transmission of CSF through washer robin spaces in head trauma. This was our hypothesis. How does it happen? I'm making it very clear. So that's the Munrakili doctrine there. Brain edema, 
brain expands, CSF and blood has to get displaced. So in cystinostomy, what we do is we propose that the cisternal fluid is what goes into the brain. And how does it go? It goes through the Warsha-Robin spaces which accompany the vessels. There it goes, the cisterns become smaller, the brain becomes edematous. What you do is you open the cisterns to the atmospheric pressure, the gradient just reverses and the brain swelling goes down. So this we term as CSF shift edema and if you type CSF shift edema probably plus my name I'm sure you get this paper. So we published this uh, in the last six months. Now a lot of people have asked me how does the pressure go up in the cisterns in the first place? That's one of the questions that I got. So you must understand that the cisterns other than the CSF in the cisterns, the other component in the cistern is the small vessels and the big vessels in the cisterns. So the capillary bleeding, the subarachnoid hemorrhage is one of the most common things that happens in severe head injuries. So this subarachnoid hemorrhage is a newcomer into the system and it is coming at a pressure of 50 plus, 50 millimeter of Hg plus. And so when it, when it is coming at, a, at that pressure, it increases the pressure in the systems. And when the pressure in the systems increases, compared to the pressure in the brain, there's a gradient from the system into the brain. And since the RBCs are too big for it to shift through the Warsha-Robin space into the brain, it is a CSF that shifts through the Warsha-Robin space into the brain, almost rapidly causing this edema. So that's, that's what happens. Now that's, those are the type 1 VR spaces in the convexity. Those are, those are the type 2 and the type 3 virtual robin spaces at the base. So these basal VR spaces are what is important. And that's what happens in trauma. Now if you do a BHC, this is exactly what's happening. You're allowing the swollen brain to herniate out. Yes, your intracranial pressure comes down. But what about your intracerebral pressure? Your intracerebral pressure is still high. And therefore, the brain has to swell in a weird fashion, stretching the axons to combat the ICP rise. So that's what Sisinosmi does. It opens systems, the gradient reverses, the brain doesn't stretch and the ICP, the intracisternal pressure and the intracerebral pressure comes down. We will not go into the cisterns, cisternal, uh, cisternostomy steps. One of the things, is there a direct correlation between open cisterns and mortality? Yes, there is. This paper proves it. What are the other evidences? Dilateral virtual robin spaces in TBI. English had documented this in 2005 and 2006. Now this article was very important for us because a lot of people ask me, why can't you just do an EVD? But you must understand that the ventricular system, the CSF in the ventricles and the brain, they don't communicate. The ISF of the brain doesn't communicate with the ventricles. While the ISF communicates with the basal cisternal CSF, the cisternal CSF. So if you are taking out CSF from the ventricles, you are only increasing the compliance of that tight system by taking a 2 ml of CSF out. You're just increasing the compliance. On the other hand, if you are taking out CSF from the cisterns, you're causing, you're causing a reversal of the gradient and you're causing the water, to, the CSF to flow back from the brain to the cisterns, thereby reducing the brain edema as such. Never happens when you do an EVD. 
So, this is the proof. That is intracisternal injection there and that's intraventricular injection. You know what happened? That's what happened in intraventricular injection. No markers at all. That's what happened in the intracisternal injection. The brain is just teeming with markers. This clearly proves that the ventricular system is a production cycle. It doesn't really communicate with the brain. While the cisternal CSF is actually clean and going in, it's actually going in into the brain. The, the conclusion for that paper was that subarachnoid CSF rapidly enters the brain parenchyma. Also, we see a lot of papers which corroborate that fact. Uh, there are many experimental studies that we are part of, we are doing, which are really exciting. Uh, and a lot of people ask me again, what is the time taken for an antacid mastectomy? So, from dural opening up to the basilar exposure, 20 minutes is max. I mean, if I don't have to do a PCP drilling. If I have to do it, if I have to do a PCP drilling, maybe 35 minutes. That's it. That's max. It's it's not like I take four and a half hours for a cystinostomy. No, no way. So after dural opening, usually it finishes within 15 minutes, maximum 35 minutes. That's it. So when is it not useful? What a score of one and two. We go by the motor score. Motor score of one and two, some cases might improve, but if there's combined radiological features of ischemia, I don't think cystinostomy is going to be useful because in the first five years, we were treating everybody because we saw some remarkable results. So we started treating everybody. But after 1,500 cases now, we think that the motor score of one and two combined with radiological features of ischemia, the results are pretty bad. Supposing you did a cystinostomy and the brain is still coming out, it's very important that one does an urgent CT scan to rule out contralateral EDH because you are causing the brain to suddenly become lax and it can result in a contralateral subdural or even a contusion blooming. An intraoperative CT scan would be useful in this case. So those are some pictures of the basilar, the basilar tip. That's a basilar tip there. That's the optic nerve. That's a carotid. That's, that's the ACA. So you're going through the window between the optic nerve, ICA, and the ACA. And that's a basilar tip. That, those are a few illustrative cases. This is our chapter, the WFM's official, chap, uh, official textbook. We have a chapter there. This was in 2012. Uh, this is a commentary written by Germany Grasso in the in a recent uh, art, recent uh, journal. This is the cooling and cleaning of the brain. If uh, this is available online, free. Uh, so this is the revolutionary paper that uh, we started talking about. That the CSF goes in and it actually cleans and cools the brain. So uh, and the the applications in uh, this paper is immense. So uh, you, you probably must uh, go and read this uh, paper, please, if anybody is interested in uh, how the CSF interacts with the brain. And then the CSF shifted EMA, which I just talked about, also is published if you, it's available online. This is one of the papers reported from uh, Iran uh, about cystinostomy. Uh, uh, in as a case report in cystinostomy. Now we have a lot of uh, people doing it, uh, especially people who do vascular surgery. They've been doing they've been doing it. That's in the World New Surgery, another article. Uh, that is a surgical technique. That's in the Asian Journal. So uh, you know one thing about cystinostomy that I have noticed is uh, doctors are like all other people. When you ask them to trade in a new idea for an old one, they jump out of their underwear. And I've been seeing this for the last 10 years. 
Uh, but if they jump out or not, what is truth must always succeed. I mean, what is truth will always, uh, you know, always win. So anybody who's seen a tight brain going down after they open the cisterns, they're, gonna, they're, not, they're not going to forget that in a jiffy. And I'm sure they, they will slowly start understanding that decompressive hemicranic is not what you should do. Neurosurgeons treat the brain like a lady. Tumors, aneurysms, and other pathologies are now treated with the utmost respect. Brain However, trauma brain is still treated like a mad woman in the 15th century. People, mostly naive residents, don't know. You can't expect her to respond in a nice way. It's high time that we change. We need to know microsurgical principles, how to open systems, because the biggest killer in neurosurgical scenario is neurotrauma. It would be more in, in a country like ours, or in China, or in India. It, it is the biggest killer. You put together all your tumors, all your aneurysms, all the rest of everything cranial, you would have more cases of neurotrauma than all of them. So it is an elephant in the room. You cannot ignore it. Young neurosurgeons and residents, they need to get into the proper training, get trained in trauma like skull base and like in microvascular. You cannot afford to just take off brain, do a simple surgery, allow the brain to swell out and accept mortality and morbidity as it is right now. Decompressive hemicranectomy was described by Koche in 1901. It's over 110 years. He's still persisting with that. It's, it's time. It's, it was the only workhorse of trauma, neuro, trauma neurosurgery till so far. It's time to hand over the baton. Thank you. John, I will stop sharing now. Okay, very good. I right, thanks for another great presentation. It's always good to hear. I'm learning more and more about cisternostomy. Uh, I'm not a neurosurgeon. Okay, Abdullah, do you have any questions for I for comments? No, I really, I really did like the presentation. I didn't uh, quite know about the approach and its advantages. It looks, uh, it's way better than the compressive hemicraniotomy. It's very, very obvious, and I, uh, I really like that you. I, I just checked now the papers. Yeah, I've seen the your work. It's yeah. Whenever I write that, it, it's you that pop up. So uh, yeah, it's a uh, very very good um, it's very good work. Thank um, you. Yeah 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 yeah. Now, now I I have a, a question. Now. Um, uh, it does have evidence evidence based uh, proof that it does work, correct? Yes, it uh, is evidence based. John. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah yeah. And and you basically need more evidence uh, in parts of the world like United States and England and stuff like that. For it to be more accepted. Now, what is the? I'm sure you've talked to lots of neurosurgeons. What is the, their main criticism of cisternostomy? What What does neurosurgeon say to you? Uh, John, the first criticism is that we don't have a randomized control trial. Okay. Uh, but I think it's like a parachute paradox. You know, I mean, you wouldn't jump out of a plane with and without a parachute. No. So it's it's pretty obvious. So when you open the systems, you know, we wanted to do a randomized control trial. I mean, this was this criticism was about five years back because uh, when we started the randomized control trial, we understood that we just sacrificing patients in the name of uh, decompressive hemicranectomy because if you do a decompressive hemicranectomy, the brain is swelling out. The only option that you have in decompression is just close the flap somehow and come back. And that's not acceptable for us. So we said we... We are not, even if this thing is not going to be accepted in a lifetime, we are not going to do a randomized control trial. But now people are past that because a lot of guys know that, um, you know, this works. So more than 30 neurosurgeons all over the world have started doing it. There have been reports coming out, editorials coming out. There's a, this is the topic for hot discussions all over the world whenever I go and present this. So people are out of the confused stage now. They understand that this works. Now the second uh, biggest uh, criticism that I get is uh, 
it's not easy. Yes, I accept that it is technically the most difficult surgery that a neurosurgeon will have to do because earlier people used to think that uh, vascular surgery is very difficult, clipping a basilar is very difficult, or a skull based tumor is very difficult. But you talking about going into the base with a really angry brain is not easy. So decompressed hemicranectomy on the other hand, it's just opening up a large 13 centimeter flap and just opening or not opening the dura and just closing. Anybody can do it. But if you want to do a cystinostomy, it has got to be through windows which are 3 into 3 into 2 millimeter. We're talking about windows between the carotid, the A1 and the optic node. That's a 3 in the 3 into 2 millimeter with an angry brain on top. That's not easy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people back out. And especially when you add maneuvers like transcavernous approaches, a posterior declinectomy, people just get scared. I mean, they just, they just get scared. They just say, I'm not going to do this for trauma. No way I'm going to do this for trauma. Because for 100 years, my residents are doing trauma. It's a simple procedure trying to complicate it. But on the other hand, they don't look at the advantages. So uh, over the last decade, I believe that this has been my major uh, criticisms. But as I said, trauma is an elephant in the room. You just cannot ignore it. Because if I'm talking about this, about for a basilar tip aneurysm, which I would see probably two, two, um, uh, two cases a year, I mean, I can understand if people say, OK, I'm not going to do for that, because it's rare. But trauma is two a day. Right. In most of the centers, probably in AIMS, it's 10 a day. In most of the centers, it's more than two a day. So if you cannot get that kind of technical expertise, you better train for that. You better train and you improve for that. So this is my answer to them. And uh, you know, as, as you asked, it's a very, very good question. These are the major criticisms. And most of the senior guys, they are not willing to go to theater at 2 o'clock in the morning and put a microscope down and you know, sit down uh, for trauma, which is considered to be an inferior branch of surgery because it's very easy. It's right. usually on my residence. You know? uh, if you talk to somebody, uh, if you go to some place in a conference and say uh, that I'm a trauma neurosurgeon, people are going to look at you like, oh, that's sweet. You know? Right. That kind of thing. But if, if you say, I am a skull-based surgeon or I am a cerebrovascular surgeon, people are going to look at you with a little more respect. Okay. Now, that is a scenario right now. So no guy, no professor is going to go out there 2 o'clock in the morning and sit down doing trauma because trauma is emergent. None of the neurosurgeons are. Right. How, how long does it take you to do a sister and ask me? Your pardon? How long does it take you to do one? Yeah, for me, it takes uh, about 15 minutes. 15 from, minutes. Yeah, okay. from dural opening to basilar exposure. Standard time is 15 minutes because, uh, well, I used to take up to two hours before. Uh, then I started, but uh, right now I take about 15 minutes. I, I, this is a, so a question from a non-neurosurgeon. Are you guided by any, like a CAT scan or anything, or is it just by blindly do you do it? Are you pardon? Do you, uh, you mean, do you, are you guided by a CT scan or or do you basically just do it by? Well, I don't use navigation. If I, if that's what you're asking, yeah, I don't I don't use navigation. Uh, I don't have navigation right now. Okay. Right now, I don't have navigation. Okay. Uh, but yes, I'm guided by the CT scan. I, I look at the CT scan and then I do this. I do the surgery after looking at the CT scan after looking at the well. We have a clinical. A radiological score. It's called the Calgary Nepal Clinical Radiological Score, and uh, that is what we depend uh, for deciding whether to do the surgery or not. Mm -hmm. But image-wise, during the surgery, I have my anatomical landmarks, and that's what I saw. Oh, okay. Now, is there any part of the world that's doing more cystinostomies than other part, parts of the world? Would you say, like, was, like India? Are they doing more than anywhere else? Yeah, a lot of surgeons, lot of surgeons are in India are doing it. Uh, a few in Europe are doing it. Uh, many surgeons in United States. I mean, if you are on Facebook, I can connect you to people because I get a lot of inbox messages saying that this is the system we did. Uh, this is the work that we did. 
Uh, in Europe and United States, people don't term it as a synostomy because there's a lot of implications uh, if they start a new surgery which is, doesn't have class 1 evidence. So what they do is very simple. They do a decompressive hemicranectomy flap and once they did the flap, they open all the cisterns which is not against evidence. So they open the cisterns and after opening the cisterns, the brain is lax. So again, in a decompressive hemicranectomy, if the brain is lax, you can keep the bone flap back. So they just term it as a decompressive hemicranectomy, but what they're doing is a synostomy. They're opening all the cisterns. Once the brain is lax, they're putting the bone flap back. Mm -hmm. So there are many people who do it. How long does it take to do a decompressive hemicraniectomy? Uh, well, a decompressive hemicraniectomy. Typically. Well, if it's, if it's fast, it should take about 15 minutes from skin, okay. to, uh, skin to decompressive. Okay. Uh, is there any other indication for a cisternostomy besides trauma? Yeah, unfortunately, not really, because uh, decompressive hemicranectomy is also done for stroke, malignant uh, brain swelling in MCA infarctions. But uh, we started doing that about uh, 10 years back. We were very excited so that uh, we, we thought we could do decompressive, I mean, cisternostomy in that condition also. But unfortunately, it doesn't work. We did it for 12 cases. I had to go in for eight cases back and uh, take the bone off. So right. I understood it doesn't work clearly. So uh, one explanation is that the edema seen in malignant brain infarction is uh, cytotoxic mm -hmm. rather than the series of shift edema. So in cytotoxic edema, it doesn't work. Okay, how long have you been advocating for sister and uh, It's about 10 years now. It's Ten years. nine years. Okay. okay. Do you see attitudes changing? Do you see more people oh, yes. open, open to it? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, John, when I started it off, uh, I mean, I was like an entertainer. You know, I remember my first talk in Cambridge. Uh, I remember... Um, throwing, I mean, fruit, the, throwing food at you? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in Adam Brooks Hospital, uh, that was my first talk. I had just about 50 patients and, uh, you know, I had no operative... Uh, um, I had no operative microscope which could record things, so yeah. um, I couldn't show anything. And uh, they were very nice to me, but I could see that I was just being an entertainer to them. It continued for uh, a few, um, one or two years, then I started to confuse people. So people were like, oh, will this work or will this not? And over the last uh, couple of years, I have understood that people uh, know that this works. But, you know, uh, change is always dif dif difficult and for something that's been followed for 100 years to bring in such a paradigm shift is, uh, you know, it's next to impossible. But in the last decade with what we've achieved, uh, the kind of change that we've seen, we're very, very happy. Um, I have a... Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so how much time do you think is, uh, is going to take until uh, sister Nasami could replace the compressive hemicranium? It's It will. Eventually it will. Uh, but uh, we don't know when because, you know, it's the attitude that has to change and the skill levels that has to change. The training. And for the skill levels, it's the training that has to change. It is, it is for the young neurosurgeons to take up that mantle because the old guys, they're not going to change. They're just not going to change because... Uh, yeah. Uh, even if they're convinced, they're not going to go into operating room at 2 a.m. in the morning and do trauma because that's a uh, life-changing thing. See? So it is for the young neurosurgeons to take up cystinostomy and, you know, and plus it's a big advantage because if you can do cystinostomy, it is the other side of the pyramid because you just, you know, you're just changing everything. If you can do cystinostomy, you can easily do any aneurysms. You can easily do any skull-based tumors. So cystinosis means the most difficult surgery. So if you can get to be a mass, get to be a master in cystinosis, aneurysm is not going to be difficult, nor is skull I, I can say one of the uh, impediments in the United States for anything new in neurosurgery is the legal, the legal climate of getting sued if you do something different and you have a bad outcome. Uh, uh, although, although you know, some situations after trauma are, are are not good, no matter what you do. However, if you did something new and there was a bad outcome, 
even though it would have been probably a bad outcome anyways, you'll get sued. Right. You'll get sued. In the United States, that's just the way it is. So cha right. change in anything is so slow in the United States. I'm sure it's not quicker in other parts of the world, but the United States is very slow. Yeah, I know that, John. See, uh, I know that change anywhere is different. And in the United States, it's much more difficult. I've had a lot of friends telling me that how difficult it is to convince somebody uh, in the ICU, the ICU guy, to con convince them, saying that, see, I'm going to do this new surgery. Um, and that, too, promulgated by somebody from Nepal and who doesn't have a class one evidence, who hasn't done a randomized control trial. So it's difficult for them. I mean, I have a lot of good friends. We teach skull base together. I'm in the, um, I teach skull base all over the world. But uh, for when I teach skull base, when I say that posterior clinical drilling can be done for basal active aneurysm, people clap. But when I say that for systemosomy, people look the other way um, okay. because it's trauma. And uh, it's, you know, a change is difficult, as you said, very rightly. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, um, Abdullah, any closing comments or questions? I mean, no, it was, that was really great. It was a very great presentation. I mean, I really, I learned a lot today. And um, it was very interesting to learn about this approach and its advantages. And hopefully it won't take that much for, for it to take over because uh, I can see the potential and uh, the difference in results. So... Uh, yeah, uh, hopefully pretty soon that would be the the norm. Or well, at least I, I may be changing the standard of care, the neurosurgery. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we wish you good luck. Okay, I, uh, we, thank you. We, we'll wrap this up and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Abdullah, John, see you then.